Welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live streaming interview series, where leading new thought teachers, speakers, and authors share the intimate stories behind the 10 best spiritual books that inspired them the most on their spiritual journey. From well-known classics to hidden gems you might never have heard of, the No BS Spiritual Book Club saves you time and money by sharing reliable recommendations from those who've walked the path before you. The No BS Spiritual Book Club, the only No BS guide to the best spiritual books to inspire your own journey of self-discovery. Here's your host, founder of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, Sandy Sedgebeer. Hello and welcome. And joining me today to share the stories behind his 10 best spiritual books is speaker, workshop leader, award-winning author and meditation dean Slyter, um, who has been teaching natural approaches to meditation and awakening since 1970. Dean gives talks, workshops and retreats throughout the United States and beyond from Ivy League colleges to maximum security prisons. His media appearances have included National Public Radio, The New York Times, Coast to Coast AM, Dr. Oz, and O, oh, the Oprah magazine. In, in addition to writing and teaching, he narrates audiobooks, co-hosts the Philosophers movie podcast, and sings with the Threshold Choir, which brings songs of comfort to the dying. And his latest book is The Dharma Bum's Guide to Western Literature, Finding Nirvana in the Classics, which is on my list of the most enjoyable, informative and enlightening books that I've read in a long time. So I hope we get a chance to hear a little bit about that later. Dean Slater, welcome. Thanks so much. It's great to be back with you, Sandy. Dean, uh, you've said that books for you, books at their best, are Dharma gates opening yes. into boundlessness. What a wonderful description. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the thing about a gate is that you don't necessarily have to keep walking through it. <laughs> if, if, it's, if it's really opened things up for you, it, it, it may be just just once and done. Yeah, um, yeah, I, that's true. I, I, I had, you know, the, so I mentioned in my, my top 10 list on, on your website and in the little preamble, I do make the point that these are the books that really were gates for me at their particular time. And some of them, it's kind of like old friends and old lovers, you know, some of them remain good friends and some, well, we're, you know, <laughs> that, 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 that it was great fun, but it was just one of those things. And now, now we've moved on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you do, uh, you're very eloquent in your descriptions. You're very eloquent in your writing. And um, I thought your, uh, you know, your opening words about what book, mean to you um, was probably one of the best that I've heard so far although I, I shouldn't I shouldn't have favorites um, but uh, yeah um, each book on your list you said is paired with an event in your life as mm -hmm. life preservers they buoyed you up when you needed ballast to continue and they are presented in chronological order as mm -hmm. lifelines to who and where you are now so mm -hmm. I must say that your list, um, your list has got my special attention for more than one reason. Uh, the first reason is for the first book you mentioned, which I'll get to in a second. And the second is um, a lot of people talk about some of the Eastern sages, uh, gurus, mm. teachers, and the names are pretty unpronounceable. But right. virtually every single one on your list is unpronounceable, so I'm going to make <laughs> you pronounce them. <laughs> Uh -huh. Yeah, so so to book number one, I mean, what are the words that one can say about this? It's been, you know, pioneering humorists, groundbreaking right. parodies, the magazine that exposed the fakery behind the image of so many familiar staples of American culture and delighted so many kids in the 50s, 60s and 70s. You're the first person to put a magazine at the top of yes. your list. And that magazine was Mad Magazine um, by the usual gang of idiots. So tell us what it was about that magazine. 
Right. So mad for, you know, thousands, if not millions of, of people and, and not just kids growing up for, for adults as well uh, through the particularly the 50s and the 60s was that unique voice of, you know, puncturing the pomposity of of politicians and showbiz and, and everything else. Um, for me, there was a particular incident when I was uh 11 or 12 years old. It was 1961. And um, we were going to go to a drive-in movie that night. (laughs) It being 1961, there were still drive-in movies. And so my mother sent me out to the garage to clear out the back seat of our Nash Rambler station wagon, it being 1961, um, to clear out the back seat of all the comic books and toys that my two brothers and I had left there. So I go out to the garage, <clears throat> and my mind, as usual, even at that age, is churning. It's what about this and what the up up and just kind of, you know, caught up in this this sort of low level anxiety that I was so used to be being caught up in that that was sort of the the normal at the time. So I'm I'm out there. My mind is racing. I'm picking up these comic books. The next one that I pick up is a Mad Magazine, and on the cover, as always, is Mad's idiot mascot Alfred E. Newman with his gap teeth and his crooked eyes and his crazy ears. And, and, and as usual, there is his motto and his famous motto was what me worry. And all of a sudden my mind stopped just silence. And what I realized, what I understood in that moment, completely non-verbally was that this thing, this churning thing that my mind was habitually doing is called worry, and that I was doing it. It was not something happening to me. It was like I had had my foot down on the, the gas pedal for so long, I didn't realize it was me revving the engine of my mind. But now I knew where the pedal was, and I could take my foot off, and wah, everything went silent. And I swear, this is no exaggeration, it was as if the top of my head opened up and what I thought of as me merged with what I thought of as the sky and I was boundless, floating in blissful boundlessness. All that night, we went and watched this completely dumb movie with Troy Donahue. The whole time I was just, and and all that way until I floated into sleep that night. So that was my introduction to what I later on read some of the other books on the list and discovered, oh, this is called Samadhi or Satori or Grace. And it's not just some random freak thing. It is getting down to the fundamental essence of consciousness, the fundamental essence of being. And there are ways to um, access that systematically and, and to integrate it into one's life so that ultimately you're walking around in that all the time, a.k.a. enlightenment. So whose magazine was it? Whose was it? Yeah. You mean who owned that copy? Yeah. I mean, you said it was in your garage, but you'd not seen it before. Uh, Well, no, I'd, they're seeing things and then they're seeing things. Ah, I'd seen that. I'd seen that. I'd seen mad. I'd seen Alfred E. Newman and I'd, I'd read what me worry hundreds of times before, but there's just that moment, you know, in the um, Indian tradition, the yogic uh, tradition, this is called Mahavakya, great utterance, where it's a particularly pungent phrase. That, and usually the traditional Mahavakyas are like Aham Brahmasmi, right? I am Brahman, I am the infinite, the infinite or Tatwamasi, you are that, you are. Um, but in this case, the, 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 the Mahavakya for me was what me worry, but you, it, it, it has to reach the right person at the right moment. And for whatever completely unexplainable reason, that was the moment for me to hear that. Did you ever tell anybody about that experience at that time? No, no. And I wasn't keeping a secret, it a secret deliberate. It, it just never occurred to me to talk about it. Mm-hmm. And I had other things actually that happened to me spontaneously like that in childhood. Um, I used to experience off and on, the only way I can describe it was that I had no face. 
It was as if as if other people were like had a seam and they were closed in the front and mine had been left open. And I know this is just essentially another kind of angle into another flavor of approaching samadhi. Uh, and and it would kind of come and go, and it just never occurred to me to mention it to anyone. And it never even occurred to me to think about it much. Or to, it was just kind of, oh, hmm. I think a lot of people have these kinds yes. of experiences, but they don't really, they just accept them as something, you know, yeah. and yeah. don't tell and, anyone. And and when, But when you talk about these things, there's probably people listening to this right now who are saying, oh, yeah. I had something like that when I was a yeah. kid. I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah. 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 I can think of one particular because, be, time. Because it's the most natural thing in the world. Yeah. And and it's yeah. really important. And I feel very fortunate that my initial experiences of this stuff were spontaneous because then you know for sure that no one owns it that no one guru or sage or savior has it locked up in their little safe and has a monopoly on it. Hmm. So did you hold on to that? I mean, did that continue onwards for you? Mm, that, that experience? That feeling. That yeah. feeling. Mm. <clears throat> the short answer is no. The longer answer is looking back, I would say that there was some uh, resonance of that and that that I would say as a person, for almost as long as I can remember, I have not done a lot of worrying. And I think that that was the effect of that. I think I really got at some level the futility of worry. And then yeah. later on, I got the confirmation of that in various scriptures where, you know, Jesus says by worrying, you can't add an inch to your height. Uh, you can't write, you know, what's, what, what, what's the point? Um, yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. So book number two, the Rubaiyat mm -hmm. of Omar Khayyam, translated by Edward Fitzgerald. I mean, that's probably, I would say, Apart from the Bible, maybe one of the oldest books that we've had on the show, mm. or at least the original, the Rubaiyat yes. is the oldest. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And since I don't read Persian, I can't tell you anything about the original. Um, but um, th this was in my, I would say, junior, senior year of high school when the, there was a lot of alcohol involved and my, my buddies and I would go on these long drunken rambles at night, walking around the, the streets of the San Fernando Valley where I grew up. And I would recite verses from the Rubaiyat. Um, and it, it's all about seizing the moment. It's all about, Oh, make the most of what we yet may spend. Ah, make the most of what we yet may spend before we too into the dust descend. Dust into dust and under dust to lie. Sans wine, sans song, sans singer, and sans end. Yeah. <laughs> so that so that hedonism and that live in the now thing very much appeal. The the you know, there's a limit to the 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 truthfulness and to the the usefulness of hedonism but it but it cut through uh uh cut through to the nowness which was very important for me then so also another um aspect on don't worry don't worry that's right that's stay right. in the now that, yeah. that's right yeah you know what who, yeah. who was it that said there's a saying um if if there oh it's from it's from a buddhist text um if there's a solution to the problem what's the point of worrying if there's no solution to the problem, what's the point of worrying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good advice. Yeah. Book number three. Now, I actually couldn't find this anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. The principal Upanishads translated by Swami. I'm going to Prabhavananda. <laughs> there you go. And Christopher uh -huh. Isherwood. <laughs> uh huh. But I couldn't actually Not find Not Christopher Isher, with Fre Frederick Manchester. We, 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 I, it turned out I remembered that wrong. I, th I think we fixed it on your website. 
Oh, we, we did. Yes, we did. I was looking at your original uh, submission. That's that's right. That's right. Frederick Manchester. I'm we we, we I, I I got my Brits mixed up. Not difficult to do. <laughs> Um, but doesn't make you very popular with them. <laughs> so tell us about the Upanishads and, and what it was about them. That just... Well, the, 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 the reading the Upanishads and also the Bhagavad Gita in these slim mentor paperback editions, and this was when I was still in high school, so this was 1965, 66. And in those days, finding those texts in the United States was not nearly as easy as it is now. I mean, now, of course, you, you order it on Amazon and it, it's delivered to your door before you close your computer. Um, but uh, in those days, the, the finding, those, those, finding those texts was much more difficult. I don't even remember how they fell into my hands. And reading the Bhagavad Gita and reading the Upanishads and reading for the first time about um, Brahman, the boundless and Atman, the true self, and and the big E equals M C squared of of enlightenment uh, in the terms of Hindu philosophy, which is Atman is Brahman, that your your true self, your ultimate self, is the boundless. Um, that was something in me just said, oh yes, of course, that makes sense. Um, that makes more sense than anything else I've heard before. And that's a, and that makes life make sense because there is the thing that is worth doing, which is realizing that coming into that as a, as an actual experience and living that day to day. And, and you were in high school. What, in, yes. In high school, my, about my last year in high school. So you were quite precocious. I mean, that mad magazine must've really kind of accelerated or yeah. opened you up in a huge way. Yeah, but you know, again, a lot, you know, I I had seen that Mad Magazine many times before, and lots of people saw Mad Magazine without having that experience. So, so I think there was some proclivity. You know, if we were in India, someone listening to this would say, "Oh, well, you must have been pra practicing. You must have been a yogi in your previous yes, lifetimes. Yes. Who, who knows?" Uh, but there was some kind of, of propensity toward that. You know, as a little kid, I was always asking those, those big questions, you know, where did everything come from and so forth, which again, I think, you know, most alert, intelligent kids do, but then most people stop and I didn't stop. Mm, yeah. So what was life like for you as a teenager then in the 60s? Because I'm sure everybody else was out there, you know, driving around, listening to the Beach Boys and um, and you've got your nose in books like this. Yeah. Well, what it was like for me as a teenager was that I was in California and it was the sixties. So psychedelics came along. Um, and so, so that became a, a part of my journey. And, uh, the, the first time I took LSD was in my senior year of, of high school, uh, in the fall of 1965 and once again, I said, oh, yes, there we go. You know, you take this little thing in 45 minutes. Once again, my skull opened up to the sky and, oh, yes, God, I, one, and done. And again, not in words, not in thoughts, just, just yeah. the experience. And, and it became very, very clear to me on my first acid trip that um, this is the Garden of Eden. This is what everyone is looking for at every moment of their lives with everything they do. And that all suffering, all sorrow, 100% is simply the expression of not having this, not being here. Uh, so it was, th that's it. I'm done. Fantastic. But then the problem is that eight hours later, you come down and when you've been in boundless bliss and then you're thrown out. You're, you're thrown out of the gates, uh, and and I went into suicidal depression. Oh, because badly. it went from. I mean, seriously. It, it, that yes, that was the. I mean, I didn't start contemplating suicide, but I knew. Oh, this is what suicidal depression feels like because you've gone from infinite. I mean, not maybe not everyone took this so deeply, but I did because okay, here you are in infinite bliss, and then you lose that, and it's infinitely intolerable. 
So it took me a couple more years of going, you know, up and down with psychedelics to finally say, okay, I'm, I'm tired of this up and down business. You know, these books I've been reading since high school, the, 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 the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita tell me that you can find a way it's more gradual it's less dramatic but it's more real you can incrementally gradually by day by day move into the kingdom of heaven and eventually you know first you you bring in your toothbrush then eventually all your furniture comes in yeah book number four warden or life in the woods by henry david thoreau yes so um I managed to get through one year of college uh, in, in, again, in the middle of all the, this hippie era. And then that was it. I was done uh, for, for then. Eventually I returned and got a bachelor's and a master's. Um, but, but I dropped out. It was the summer of 67, summer of love. And um, I kind of became a sort of self-styled hippie sod who, a you know, wandering holy man just hitchhiking around the country, riding freight trains with the hobos, dropping in and out of communes and crash pads. And my very few worldly possessions were on a little canvas bag uh, held over my back. And I had two books in there. One was uh, the Tao Te Ching, which said the way to do is to be right on. And the other was Walden. And Walden said, simplify, simplify, simplify. And that was, that was my, 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 my mission at the time to, to live that simple life. Now, later on, I realized that the way to do is to be does not mean don't do stuff, just sit around being, but it means to have those two so integrated is that doing is the same as being. That How long did it take you to get to that point? Uh, well, it, it's an ongoing process. It's an ongoing process where we're, I'm still moving my furniture in. What happened when you stopped bumming around? Um, well, what happened was, and that brings us to, I think, the next book, which is uh, uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi's translation uh, and commentary. Yes. Okay, let's do this one next, okay? Yes, um, no, it is yet next. Oh, yeah. good. So is Maharishi's commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, um, chapters one through six. He never never got to the other 12 chapters, um, but he didn't need to. Uh, the main thing that he brought out in his commentary, because I had been reading the, the scriptures uh, like so many people were at the time and, and still are, and interpreting them as mandating a life of asceticism, saying that that in order to reach enlightenment, you have to re have a monastic life. You can't be uh, involved in career and marriage and raising children and all that. And, and Marishi just broke it down verse by verse, line by line and showed, no, that's not what it's saying. The key verse for him is uh, chapter two, verse 48, yoga sta kuru karmani. Yoga sta, sta as in English, sta established yoga union. So established in, in union with the infinite. Kuru Karmani, perform action. There, there's the whole thing in a nutshell. F is through your meditative activities, expand your 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 attention so that you're you're permanently or perpetually established in the the felt sense, the direct experience of boundlessness. And then so you you realize yourself as the ocean, and then you can come back to acting on the level of waves and you'll be fine because you're established in the ocean. You'll never be overwhelmed by the waves. And that was the point at which things changed for you. As you said, you got a haircut. I got so it. You right. became a teacher. Yeah. Because I knew, I, I knew I was born to be a teacher. Um, and I wanted to teach Maharishi's particular approach to this. We call transcendental meditation. Uh, and his whole thing was, and and this was at the time in the 60s when it was, you know, the lifestyle revolution and it was the, the counterculture versus the establishment. And um, and here Maharishi was saying, no, simple, natural, effortless, 20 minutes twice a day. Don't change your diet. Don't change your lifestyle. And I said, ah, here is this life changing teaching, but in a form that I can, you know, so to speak, bring home to mom and dad. I can bring this back to the suburbs. Uh, and, and, and that seems like something worth doing. So 
you know, and Maharishi, despite his own long hair and beads said, no, but you're Westerners. And, and we have to demonstrate to people that this is not some weird, exotic, Eastern hippie cult something. Uh, and, and really Maharishi, although I later on moved on and his, his, his uh, approach wound and his organization had certain kinds of constrictions that eventually just became, uh, you know, compelled me to move on. But, but his contribution of bringing meditation into the mainstream, showing it's not weird, it's beneficial. The fact that, you know, you can take meditation courses now at your local Y or public library, and it's considered, you know, it's there in the mainstream is very, very much due to, to Maharishi's activity. So did you read that round about the time of uh, when the Beatles were in India. Yes. I mean, is that what turned you on to it? No. In, in fact, the, fa the fact that the Beatles were there and that they were big pop culture heroes made me a little bit wary. <laughs> like, is this, you know, is, is this, is this going to be too, too cool now? Um, but that was, that was just me. So, but yeah. And, you know, first the Beatles were there and then the Beatles left, but, you know, I was, you know, I, the experience of reading Maharishi's commentary on the Gita at the time for me was powerful enough that the, the Beatles didn't matter much either way. Yeah, interesting. After the Beatles went there, everybody was growing their hair. You got your hair cut. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. first, first in, first out. Yeah. So the next book, Miracle of Love Stories, about Neem Karoli Baba by Ram Das. Ram Das, yeah, A Miracle of Love. Um, so this book I encountered in the early nineties, I was trying to write a book. Uh, I was doing interviews with prominent people in various fields about the teachers and mentors that were key to their lives. I got to interview a, a lot of great people. I, uh, a lot of my childhood heroes, Pete Seeger and Cesar Chavez and, Carl Bernstein, the Watergate reporter, and, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Dizzy Gillespie, and it, it was fantastic. Um, and and I made an appointment to interview Ramdas on the phone. And at that point, we had all read uh, "Be Here Now," right? His seminal book. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to a little more background about his teacher, Neem Karoli Baba or Maharaji. Mm -hmm. So I went to this bookstore that had a copy, and I stood there reading it in the aisle. And once again, something started to happen. I started to, through the medium of those stories, all these anecdotes about Neem Karoli Baba, I started to experience what in India they call darshan, the presence of the teacher, the spiritual, not seeing his face, because that's not important, but the spiritual presence, the, the boundlessness that that the teacher is, and that I am and you are, that everyone is, that everything is, but that the teacher embodies in kind of an expressed, super vivid way so that other people on a good day, if they're receptive, can sort of pick up on it. That's called darshan. So I'm standing here in the aisle of this bookstore, turning pages going, <laughs> turn three, the next one, <laughs> my brain is exploding into this darshan experience. And now this actually, this really points out what we were saying at the outset about books as, as gates, because <laughs> having had this experience, I went, wow, this book's really good. This is the magic book. I want all my friends to have this experience. So I bought every copy in the place. I bought like a dozen copies or whatever they had and started mailing them to all my friends so that they could all share in that. And of course, it didn't work for them. Mm -hmm. because they were not that person at that moment. And I yeah. still have that book on my shelf. I can go pick it up now and doesn't particularly do much for me. Yeah. 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 You can't, you can't give somebody enlightenment. Can you, they've got no. to be ready to receive you gotta, it. You know, there's this great Zen story about a monk who is, um, he's rowing a boat across a, a foggy lake. And out of the fog, he hears the cawing of a crow. And somehow that's just the 
the final trigger he needs and all of illusion, all of restriction falls away and he falls open into enlightenment, right? Great story. And, you know, Zen, you know, is full of stories like that. But when I read that story, it occurred to me, you, you know, the the wrong conclusion to draw from that would be, oh, I got to find that lake. I got to find that crow. So, and Roak, wait for the fog to roll in and, and then I'll get enlightened. That That's not the point. It yeah. can be anything and it can be yeah. nothing. Yeah. And any time. Yes. Any time. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a great story. I mean, you seem to have had so many um, really visceral, huge experiences. Yeah. But again, the, you know, when when you have those openings, you go, oh, of course, it's the most natural thing in the world. It when, when the the more familiar you become with what you actually are, which is the ocean, the idea that you ever could have been identified as this little wave over here just becomes. And how how could I ever have thought that? Mm. Yeah. Well, you you know, we ask everybody to give us a few keywords that uh, tell us a little bit about them. And uh, one of yours was Lucky Duck. And I thought, <laughs> hmm, I wonder why he thinks, you know, in what aspect of his life does he think he's a lucky duck? But I think I know now. <laughs> yeah, well, that that's the that's the main one right right there. N yeah. Nothing further need be said about that. But but something else, many people, maybe most people to come to the spiritual path have to have some kind of crisis. You know, they, they have to come to the end of the line with the, the non-spiritual, with, you know, investing their happiness in particular outcomes in the finite world. They have to have a career meltdown or a, you know, romantic disaster or the death of a loved one or a serious illness, something like that. Uh, I've had some of those things happen in my life subsequently, but I, in my case, I, again, maybe because of just some proclivity I was born with, I didn't need to have crisis to get me on the spiritual path. It just seemed, well, of course, this is what one would do with one's life. So I've been lucky that way. And I've been lucky in that I've not had to have a lot of bad disaster. I've been just extremely fortunate. I was married to a wonderful woman uh, who, you know, raised two incredible kids, now have five beautiful grandbabies. Um, uh, my first wife passed away. Uh, I met another just perfect, perfect, lovely partner on the path. I met both of my wives on meditation retreats, um, which is, uh, I recommend it way, way better than singles bars. Um, and, and, uh, yeah. And, and so, yeah, it's been a lucky life in every way. Lucky duck, yeah. So book number seven, The Crystal and the Way of Light. And I'm yes. going to let you pronounce the Na, Nam Kai Norbo Rinpoche. Nam Kai Norbo Rinpoche. Okay. Um, yeah, he is uh, one of the last lamas who grew up in Tibet and got the traditional teachings, the traditional training there uh, before the Chinese invasion. And they were the, the monks were forced into exile. He wound up in Italy. Um, but that book introduced me to the, the Tibetan Buddhist path. And I wound up actually largely through my connection with my, my late first wife, Maggie. Um, she had a particular proclivity that I think she was born with uh, towards specifically the Tibetan path, the Vajrayana path. Mm -hmm. and, and so we got involved together in Tibetan Buddhist practice in a pretty serious way for several years. Um, and, uh, and eventually, I think the Buddhist book that really uh, came home to me the most was the, um, the Mother of the Buddhas, which is a translation of the Prajnaparamita Sutra by Lex Hickson. Uh, and I, I recommend that one very highly, Mother of the Buddhas. It, it's, it's, it's really just clear, clear, clear. Mm. Yeah, you say there's a key line in that book, enlightenment is nothing other than the spontaneous experience of possible structures as equivalent to open space. Yeah, yeah. 
Right. All And not only all structures, but all possible structures. So you never have to worry about, okay, everything I've experienced so far is nothing but open space, nothing but the infinite. Every wave I've experienced so far is nothing but ocean. But the next one waiting around the corner might be the exception to the rule. We, we know that not as a thought, but experientially, it's not possible for any thing to be other than that. Mm. Book number eight is one that has been described as the last spiritual book you'll ever read. <laughs> right. I am that. I am that by, by Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj. Um, yes. So Sri Nisargadatta Maharaj was a great, great exponent of non-duality, which is really what we've been talking about, that, yeah. that, that the, the, the I that seeks or the I that thinks it's seeking boundlessness is from the beginning, none other than the boundlessness that it seeks. Um, and and Nisarga Datta uh, made his living running a little booth selling beaties, these little hand rolled cigarettes that are popular in in uh, India. So he was the enlightened cigarette merchant, and 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 he had a little apartment in a in a tenement in Bombay, and he uh, and people wound up coming from all over the world to hear him give satsang, to to have the 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 dialogues, the discourses. Uh, of, of just helping people open themselves to this non-dual understanding. Um, and the book I Am That is the transcripts of, of many of those dialogues, years of those dialogues. And I think I mentioned this in my little commentary there. I've never read it straight through. I can't get through more than about a page and a half, and I feel like my skull is exploding open again. I go, good, fine. It's done its work. Put it down. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Let me mention, by the way, though, because this is a thing, because that book is very popular and a lot of people love the fact, as I do, that Nisarga Data was just uncompromising in the non-duality, just, just kind of slash and burn. If he didn't think you were serious, he would throw you out of the room. But what's not mentioned in that book, and you, you have to read about Nisarga Data elsewhere to find out that also twice a day, every day, he walked across town to where the street corner where they were doing the bhajans, the singing the, the devotional songs. So the devotional aspect is, is also there parallel with and alongside of and supporting the, the, you know, the, the cold clinical non-dual discrimination. Mm. Book number nine, Presence Volume One, The Art of Peace and Happiness by Rupert Spira. Yes, Rupert Spira. And as I'm speaking to you, Sandy, I'm actually on a retreat with Rupert Spira here in Northern California. Um, uh, Rupert is, um, uh, he's become, for me in these latter years, um, almost the only person that I can listen to about these matters. His, his, um, his way of of expressing non-dual reality um, is so clear, so lucid, so really free of cultural baggage, historical baggage, any kind of guru BS. At the beginning of this retreat, someone <clears throat> up in the front of the room, this is at our, our first meeting with, with, with Rupert a week ago, Someone left a, a bunch of flowers, had put a bunch of flowers on, on his little table next to his seat there. Um, and he smiled and he was very gracious and he had them removed. And he said, no, that feels a little bit too much like a proper guru. Mm. Right. I mean, he's just he, he's just not going to allow anyone to try to regard him as a as a guru. And unlike many retreats I've, I've been on with wonderful teachers Every meal, Rupert's down there sitting at one table or the other, hanging around, joking, talking about movies and whatever else with, with, with everyone. And he's just, uh, he's just a wonderful teacher. I really, and Spira, S-P-I-R-A, I, I really uh, um, 
anyone whose ears are perking up right now, yeah, do check it out. He continues to write books. I actually just bought, I haven't read this one yet. This is a recent book of his called Being Myself, which um, several people here on the retreat, and actually Rupert himself said, I think of all my books so far, this is the one that that says the thing most concisely. It's, it's, it's nice and slim, most concisely and most clearly. So, so uh, maybe after I finish reading this, I'll want to substitute it on on the list for the one i have now yeah come back and do another 10. sure so number 10 itself is the enlightened heart an anthology of sacred poetry edited by stephen mitchell yes this is a wonderful wonderful book um poems from uh, eastern traditions and western traditions from shakespeare dante um uh chuang Tzu, uh, of course, Rumi, of course, Kabir. And um, again, this is a book where you can, this is a good book to have on your nightstand because you can open it up, read one poem and go, oh, right, there it is. I'm reminded, I'm brought back home to myself again. Uh, and this book was particularly helpful to me. Uh, I actually had a day job for 33 years. I, I taught English at a, um, a, a very fine independent school in New Jersey. I also, of course, wound up running meditation programs there. And I developed an elective English course called Literature of Enlightenment, uh, where the lab work was, of course, meditation. Everyone knew my classroom because it was the one that instead of rows of desk chairs that had a, a circle of comfy couches. And um, we read the gospel according to Thomas, and we read um, the Dharma Bums by Jack Kerouac, all sorts of fun stuff. And I needed a book of poetry. And I finally, I found that one. And that was, I found that was the best anthology. I could just ask, the, I could open it at random, or I would tell the kids, read a couple of poems tonight, come back tomorrow with one that, that, um, uh, uh, lit the lights for you or puzzled you or somehow caught your attention. And they would do that. They say, what about this one here? And, you know, we could always talk for 45 minutes about any one of those poems. Mm. And, and by the way, Stephen Mitchell wrote another book, which is a must read for many people called the gospel according to Jesus, where he, he, because he's the scholar of ancient languages as well as a lifelong Dharma practitioner. And for anyone who is interested in, well, how do I reconcile the enlightenment path with my Christian beliefs or my Christian background? That's the book that will straighten that out for you. Mm. And that course that you taught, Literature of Enlightenment, of course, ultimately mm -hmm. was the inspiration for your new book, The Dharma Bum's Guide to Western Literature finding nirvana in the classics oops there it is yep. right it's being um published this next week march 29th week. from new world library um i'm very excited this is copy number one new world library did just a beautiful job uh, of producing this book and yes it came out of teaching that course and just a, um, all my years of teaching all my literature courses and continuing with my spiritual practice. And, you know, if you, you teach Huckleberry Finn for 33 years, or you teach the great Gatsby for 33 years, you keep coming back to it year after year. You know, again, this is why I'm a lucky duck. I had this opportunity to keep going deeper and deeper into these books. And every year now I had another year of meditative practice and spiritual insight under my belt. And I started making these connections wait a minute, when Huck Finn first rose out, he's running away from his brutal drunken father and he rose out into the middle of the Mississippi River in this canoe and finally escapes into safety and he lies down in the bottom of the canoe and looks up into the sky, into the moonlight, and he says, the sky looks ever so deep. When you, when you look at it lying on your back, looking up into the moonlight, I never knowed it before, right? I never knowed it before. That's an initiation. That's an opening into a new experience. And what is that new experience? The boundlessness. The sky is ever so deep. That This is a baptism into the transcendent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I'm looking at this stuff going, wait, am I the only person who's noticed this? I better write this down. So 
So I've got 22 chapters in here, a chapter on Huckleberry Finn, one on Moby Dick, one on Macbeth. Uh, I've got poetry of Emily Dickinson, Walt Whitman, Gerard Manley Hopkins, John Keats. Um, uh, yeah, and, and, and on and on. Uh, waiting for Godot. And, um, and then I threw in for, for fun some unexpected things. Uh, I put in one Broadway musical, Oklahoma. I put in Dr. Seuss, The Cat in the Hat. Uh, my, my last chapter is on the American national anthem, the Star Spangled Banner, plus some yeah. alternative possible anthems. So, yeah, I had tremendous fun writing this thing. So, so tell us how, what you found in, in um, Cat in the Hat and uh, Oklahoma. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, where to begin? There's so much. Um, Oklahoma. Oklahoma, which which opened on Broadway in 1943, in the middle of the Second World War. My father was my father was in England, flying uh, out of the uh, Eighth Air Force in East Anglia, uh, dropping bombs, destroying uh, uh, the German factories. Um, and um, when Oklahoma opened, um, no one expected it to be a hit. It, it was by uh, it was, uh, an unknown uh, playwright who was a closeted gay former cowboy from Oklahoma who wrote this story about um, uh, the struggles between cowboys and farmers. And um, the, the opening night, they, they were having trouble filling the house. They had all these unsold tickets, so they sold, sent people out in the street, ushers out into the streets, to give tickets away to GIs on leave. And when the curtain opened, when, what they saw was revolutionary because musicals in those days opened with the orchestra pumped up fortissimo and out would come the chorus line, the chorus girls, you know, kicking up their shapely legs. And instead what they heard was the curtain opened to a, to a, a set of a, of a farm, a ranch with a bunch of corn in the background and an old lady on stage churning butter the orchestra dwindles down to a single flute twittering like a bird in the morning. And from off stage, a cappella, a baritone voice. And the male leads in Broadway shows in those days were tenors. But now here's this hearty baritone singing, There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. Right? And according to Agnes DeMille, the choreographer, she said, something happened that I've never heard in the theater before. The entire audience as one went, ah. Right. Now, I take that. There's a bright golden haze on the meadow. What is a meadow? A meadow is an uncultivated plot of land. Right? What is the uncultivated part of of our experience. That's our beingness. That's our, everything else has been cultivated with thoughts, feelings, sensory perceptions. The one, the virgin part, the uncultivated part, our inner meadow, that's what Jesus called the kingdom of heaven within you. That's our pure beingness, our pure awareness. Meadow. Now, the bright golden haze, this is what happens when we meditate, when we sink into our inner meadow. All the outer noises, you know, the traffic on the street, the barking dog, all that, it's still there, but it's sort of like behind a, a haze. But it's not a dull haze. It's not a smudge. That's what happens when we get sleepy as we're drowsing into sleep. It's a bright golden haze, right? Now, this is very precisely how physiologists describe what happens when you meditate. They call it the, the, the wakeful hypometabolic physiological state, the state where everything has settled down into quietness, into beingness, um, into not awareness of this and that, just awareness, but not losing awareness as in sleep, wide awake to experience that silent, bright golden haze. Okay. So that's for starters. That's one page. <laughs> that's one yeah. page of this book. I got 300 more pages like that. I will say that if, if you've read most of the books that you cover, 
Mm-hmm. You'll never read them again the same way after right. reading your book. Right. And, um, and, yeah. and also, I tried to write it in such a way that you don't necessarily have to have read them all. You know, no. Uh, no. You, you don't have to read all 700 pages of Moby Dick to, to understand what I'm talking about there. I, I, I give you yeah. enough of the content. And it's a great history lesson because we also get to learn about every single author as well. Yeah. 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 I mean, and there's so much fascinating stuff. The fact that William Blake and, you know, many spiritual adventurers are aware of 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 William Blake, you know, ah, sunflower, weary of time, who countest the steps of the sun seeking. Not everyone understands that line. Sunflowers are heliotropic as the sun crosses the sky. The sunflower actually turns its head. Right. And that's like the soul, the Atman yearning for the Brahman, yearning for the infinite. But, you know, the key is in the name. The word sun is in the word sunflower. Right. That thou art. You all you've been that all along. So, Mm -hmm. ah, sunflower, weary of time, who countest the steps of the sun, seeking after that sweet golden climb where the traveler's journey is done. Right, that all seeking that enlightenment, seeking that that the, to get through those those gates of paradise. So, Blake wrote a lot of wonderful stuff like that, which I break down. Then his life is fascinating because he was also a political radical who helped storm the gates of of Newgate Prison, set the prison on fire, and 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 set the prisoners loose. Um, once was was thrown into court for getting into a fist fight with a British soldier, um, and also. There's some possibility that his visions were inspired in part by um, a a medical condition called ergotoxicosis, which comes from eating uh, rye, the grain rye that's been infested by a purple fungus, which is the precursor of LSD. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, all kinds of fascinating stuff in these lives. Yeah. Yeah, it really is um, a book worth reading. Absolutely. Um, We don't have much time left, but there's a couple of things I quickly want to ask you about. Mm -hmm. Um, The Threshold Choir. Yes. Um, What a beautiful organization that is. It is. Just say a few words about it. Yeah, so the Threshold Choir, uh, which started in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, sings for people who are getting ready to cross thresholds mainly the threshold from from living into dying so they sing in hospices sometimes in private homes or or hospitals um and uh they sing mostly their original very simple songs um uh like may peace be with you Peace be with you now, and so forth. And and we learn these songs in three-part harmony. Um, we practice usually near where I live. We had to put it all on Zoom for now because of, of, of COVID. But before that, we were practicing in a church near my house, and we would sit in a big circle and learn these songs and learn the harmonies. And in the middle of the circle, we'd have a recliner, and once during each rehearsal, someone would volunteer to lie in the recliner and be the dying person. And then three or four of us, because when you do this stuff bedside, you do it in a small group of three or four. Yeah. We'll, we'll sit there on little stools with the person and sing to them. And um, usually the dying person is crying by the end. Um, there's just the, that opening of that. Uh, is is just so lovely. So it started in the Bay Area, but there are chapters now all over the U.S. and in some other countries. So if you're anyone who's hearing this that says, wait, singing to dying people, that speaks to me. Just go to, to thresholdchoir.org and yeah. uh, check it out. It's a very touching video there of uh, three of the ladies, including the one that started it, um, singing to a man who's dying and yeah. he's he talks to about the experience i mean i've never heard of it before but it is just a you know it's yeah. something that needs to be supported my my challenge is that most of the people in the choir are women and the parts are are written for female voices and i'm a baritone so i so so i have to work hard at being an alto um uh, and 
you know, it is an interest. We could do a whole other show on this. Why is it that that when you have a meditation retreat, when you read books, these things, it's so many more women usually who show up than men. Um, and and my theory, the short version is, well, women are wise, but <laughs> we we could talk more about it. Yes, indeed, it is. It is an interesting question. So. Very quickly, what are you reading now? Um, right now, I'm 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 not reading anything because I'm on a meditation retreat. Okay, you've got um, no no right. book sitting on your bedside table at home. Yeah, um, there, there's uh, well, actually, it's it's my latest uh, book by Rupert. I'm just starting okay. this one, being myself. Okay. Okay. And final, final one. You yes. say in your bio that one of the things you love to do is zip around Santa Monica on your Vespa. Yes. I want to know why a Vespa and not a motorbike? Um, I started riding Vespas in high school. And there's just something about them that 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 appealed to me. Um, and, um, you know, I, f I feel like motorcycles are kind of the sharks of the the road and vespas are the dolphins yeah there's yeah, something that's... friendly about them they make people smile um mm -hmm. and i just feel very and you know i could write a whole actually my next book is going to have a chapter i think on it's going to be the the vespa sutras uh all about the the you know breaking down the the the, the spiritual opening of writing on a Vespa because you're not closed in, you're in the open sky. It, it emulates that, that opening to the, to the boundless that the boundless. enlightenment is all about. Yeah. And it makes going anywhere fun. Okay. Go to the drugstore, go to the, the, the post office. Great. Doesn't I matter. Personally think and, a lot more fun. and that's, and that's what enlightenment is, is like, doesn't matter what you're doing, where you're going. It's just so much fun to be doing it. Yeah. Dean Slater, thank you for adding your 10 best uh, list of spiritual books to the No BS Spiritual Book Club archive. It's been such a pleasure, Sandy, anytime. Thank you. You can learn more about Dean Slater's books at his website, deanslater.com, and that is Slater spelt S-L-U-Y-T-E-R. And do check out the thresholdchoir.org as well. And now, as the spiritual book market becomes increasingly crowded, it is becoming ever more challenging to sort the wheat from the chaff, which is why we launched the No BS Spiritual Book Club, so that we could provide you with trusted recommendations from authors, teachers, speakers, and others who have walked the path before you. You can check out our free 10 Best Spiritual Books archive at the No BS Spiritual Book Club .com, where you can also view previous episodes of this interview series and add your name to our Save My Space list to get last minute reminders of upcoming episodes. That brings us to the end of this week's show. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and I'll be back at the same time next week with another 10 Best Spiritual Books interview. Till then, it's goodbye from me. <laughs>